Okay, Ruler, settle down. Ruler School is brought to you by Odyssey Games, where you can go to get pre-orders of all the upcoming Force of Will sets, as well as releases of previous sets after they come out. CCGprime.com, with over 100,000 Force of Will singles, as well as out-of-print boxes from the past, and TCG accessories. As well as FowlLibrary.com, a wonderful resource for deck lists, article discussions, and more. Check them out at FowlLibrary.com. As well as these amazing patrons. Special thanks to guest lecturer member, Vite Raman. Thank you for your support. Class is in session. Hey there rulers, DM073 here bringing you another feature match for the week. Time for something a little bit different. We haven't shown you what a competitive Nyarlathotep list looks like, uh, specifically this idea of the Nyarly pop-off, but our resident red player Paul Clute is happy to oblige, and I am playing what I call the Order Killer. It is a Stemma Carlina. It is designed to do everything to stop the Order decks from doing what they do best. It is designed to kind of keep the advantage to a minimum, disrupt their game plans, and then just kind of grind them out, making use of Carlina so that we have some early game will to be able to keep up with kind of the low cost or kind of pop off uh, elements that they have in terms of being able to play through some answers that we've seen in some order, you know, matches, as well as a Stemma to give us card advantage by constantly drawing extra cards, you know, that once per turn extra draw card, turning every card in the deck essentially into a cantrip, as well as having this J Ruler hate that doesn't require us to cast a card. Paul joking, showing me the bottom of his stone deck that he has 20 fire basic stones, so there was no reason for me to cut his stone deck, but I did it anyway for the sake of it. Um, Paul actively trying to build 20 completely unique fire stones, which I'm not sure if we have 20 unique fire stone artworks, but it is something, certainly something he can try for in this deck. So we'll have to see exactly how this goes. There are a lot of Carlina's discard resonators that provide a lot of potential answers for what the order decks are doing, particularly Nyarlathotep and Kagia. Um, we're going to go ahead and hit that first turn six Sage Stone, and so as we don't waste will, we're going to go ahead and float some will with Carlina, and then play a black Witch of the Fallen Kingdom. This is mainly just, again, we're not really worried about Nyarlathotep doing any searching, so there's really not going to be much here, and it's kind of more important for us to get a body on board as a potential blocker, um, so we don't want to waste our, like, one spell per turn later. We might as well slam it on the board now. So we see an ordered um, Red Riding Hood come off the coin here. This is one of the things that kind of is something important to know when you're playing against Nyarlathotep, is that Nyarly's weakest moments are when she's waiting for an enter to resolve that's going to get her some stones. So even if they're ordered, that still creates a trigger. So the thing is still getting, um, still present on the board. And Red Riding Hood specifically is only a 4-7 because of the bonus of this particular Gnarly that gives swiftness. So it has that inherent weakness, which is why cards like Gradius exist in the deck of the Order Killer deck. So this is really great. We get to, he'll still get the enter effect, but we get to kill the Red Riding Hood before it gets its stone. A Stemma then gets us a free card off of that, which we'll catch here in a second. So we turned Gradius into a cantrip, keeping up our hand advantage. And then Paul can still call stone if he wants, but all he gets is a one drop, and then those two stones are just going to go back to the bottom of the deck. Now he could banish them if he wants, if he's got a card to be able to make use of them, um, because stones in the grave are just as good for Nyarly with things like Dr. Magra. And in fact, that's what we're going to see. So we're going to see an arena expansion relay come into play by banishing that fire magic stone, and he is going to choose to just shuffle it back into his deck. Uh, or put it back at the bottom of his deck. They're all basic fires, so once again, it doesn't really matter where they go. And down comes the second one. So a little bit of cantripping here, making use of some good value um, to the play through the punish, uh, in a sense, which is pretty good. And then just to pass the turn, because after ordering, there's no super great one drop to play um, if your order ruler got killed, or unless you have an Isis. So we're going to call Stone with a Stemma here, because there's nothing for her to shoot. Swinging for 30, uh, forward damage and get down to 36. Good. Pass the turn there. You see the hand here. Uh, it's got a couple sudden manifestations of power. Um, 
It looks like a uh, Phantasmal Ascendant, Magic Stone Dance of Chaos. No Isis though, um, and that's kind of a big piece here. So before draw, um, before draw, or sorry, after draw, after recovery, but before moving into main phase. So this is mainly so that we can float some will uh, without really missing anything. We can float some will with the six Sage Stone, and then we need to be able to use Carlina here to be able to produce double white. We're gonna cast Dance of Spirits. And so what this is gonna do is we're doing the silence mode. Uh, so this is another really good tech card against the Gnarly decks because this does lock them out of being able to order because you have to be able to cast a spell to be able to order. So we're just gonna see a Callstone pass, uh, I believe from Paul at this point. One thing to note is that we, if we can get to five stones, which of the Fallen Kingdom suddenly becomes which of the Pointy Hat Witch, uh, because we're playing those in the sideboard, which is pretty good. Um, so if we can stall to that point, it also potentially becomes which of Quenched Fires, which prevents us from taking fire damage from abilities, which is also pretty great, especially if Paul's playing any kind of burn spells. We haven't seen any from the deck as of yet, so maybe Pointy Hat Witch might be better, but it is still something to keep in mind. We see a Ordered Isis. Now this is kind of a little bit of a misplay on my side. The um, timing of the uh, the timing of the silence should have been done. I should have held on to it and waited until he committed to an Isis, because the idea is, in response to the Isis trigger, uh, when she's going to resonance, you can just uh, silence them in response, so that like they're not going to get as much value out of the Isis that turn. Like all that extra producing will, if they try to counter out with things like sudden manifestation of power here, they're not going to get the value because they have nothing else to be able to cast. Um, so the Isis is like going to trigger. They'll call stone. They can draw some cards, I guess, but the floating will is just not going to go anywhere. We did see a uh, Garion come down to stop the sudden manifestation of power, just to prevent him from kind of cantripping off there. Um, does still get to call stone for turn, so he gets to use the floating from the stone he called into play with Isis to play another sudden manifestation of power. And this is kind of showing how, even if you're playing kind of an answer deck, if you sequence things properly, you can, um, uh, you, you can find your way to play through. Like this this matchup, um, just in general, high-level high games is about sequencing, is about figuring out exactly the play line here to make sure that you get to the right spot. Remember, we still haven't cast a card yet this turn, technically. We're still sitting on a uh, number 13 there that we could cast. Um, or as you see there, an Inferno in hand. We could use a God Art there. And when he does, if he does banish a stone uh, to draw a card off of Isis, we are going to get to draw a card off of a Stemma, which is very nice, or produce color if we want it. So Sudden Manifestation of Power essentially generates two will and draws a card because it's going to bring a stone into play recovered. Isis is then going to trigger. Uh, and also now we have Red Wine and Bread up. So that's, we're up to three triggers on the, I think... Maybe just one trigger on the red, wine, and bread at this point. Um, because it brought in its own stone. Let's move into swing with the Isis. We block with the... Um, block with the uh, Witch of the Fallen Kingdom. Gonna banish, which is then gonna help us produce some color. Although I do believe we might draw a card off of the Estema. An entity went from field to grave this turn. Banishes it again to keep drawing. Float some will. We can see a Phantasmal Ascendant come down here, which is essentially going to cantrip um, because it's going to bring a stone into play recovered, which then generates one will with the Isis and another proc for the red, white, and bread, up to two procs total. And one thing to note is for the red, white, and bread is that the procs are for everything that comes into play afterwards, too. It doesn't just give it to the things that are on the field. 
So everything for the rest of his turn is getting a plus six plus six. Now the Phantasmal Ascendants do not have swiftness and there's not a real way outside of playing the three drop guy that you can discard uh, to give his guys swiftness. So it comes down to, you know, how are we going to deal damage here? Floating some more, playing one red to cast uh, Rebirth of Flaming Disaster. This is going to put a lot of tokens into play. He's got a total of seven stones, so it's going to put seven 4-4 four, four tokens into the field that all have plus three or plus six plus six, so threatening 7,000 damage, um, which is quite a lot, more than I have, if you'll notice. Now, there is a world where you see we have that number 13 in hand. There is a world where we cancel this um but the problem is with making that play line if we cancel this he still has the isis so what's going to happen is um he could just banish stones and find another one um, because he'd still have a j ruler on field so because we have access to the inferno which we can instant speed um get and have the will to pay for right now because of carlina it's actually better for us to let him commit to killing his own j ruler um and we'll take the the 10 here, go down to 30, goes to swing in for another uh, set of damage, and the main reason why we're willing to take the 10 is when we want to try to get the most value possible off of this uh, Inferno that we're about to try to go for, so hopefully that pays out because we could have Inferno'd in response to the first attack and stayed at four grand. Down comes the Inferno. Let's just say we, we got our Carlina um, so that we can save the Estema got art for later. Uh, force him to, we have no entities on field, so this is gonna force him to get rid of everything, including the Red Vine and Bread, which is nice. Gets rid of both Phantasmal Ascendants, just clears that whole field, takes him down to three grand with us. He's still got five floating will though. Uh, he is gonna have to discard some cards, I believe. Does have that second Isis. Can't order it, but it still can be there to help do resonance triggers. Spend one for a Magic Stone Dance of Chaos which gets him three more stones. And this is one of the things of like being able to play through, right? If you sequence things properly, you're you're in a good spot to be able to potentially play through. Um, and having multiple licenses and stuff like that. It's one of the reasons why I've talked about before that nearly can be really hard to stop once she gets rolling. So the idea is to try to stop her before she even gets there. Like prevent her from even trying to pop off so that you don't have to deal with it. And then they can kind of crumble. We've talked about this before too, that if the gnarly deck can't establish, can't get started, it has a really hard time closing games. And this is a good example of what happens when you don't stop it. So this Yarlathotep just trying to dig, trying to find something here, still threatening 3,000 damage, doesn't really have a way to do swiftness, doesn't have a way to make more tokens, has to find a way to potentially kill here, because if it doesn't, it's going to waste a lot of that will, and potentially just be in a really bad spot, because it burned a lot of resources trying to get me down, and right now it's only at, I've only taken 1,000. Banishing two more stones here, we see a Dogra Magra. Definitely has at least 10 stones between the field and the grave, so it gets to choose the number, uh, which will shoot me for 2,000. Banishes that last stone to get itself a relay, which can then shuffle all those stones back into the deck if he chooses to, or leave them in grave for another uh, um, Dogra later, ultimately deciding, no, I want those stones back in the deck. I'm going to go ahead and cantrip here. Taking me down to a grand total of one grand and getting himself back up to five. We see a demon beast come into play here. Just a swiftness, but because it's got that pump, it's currently 12-12, so it is enough for lethal. Swings with the Nyarlathotep. We have some answers here with Mermaid of 
blasting a despairing voice to be able to put it back into his hand but again it's got so much draw power here that phantasmal ascendant comes down gets him another stone gets to produce black with that new stone and can recast it and go into play so it did end up that taking that first thousand damage actually did cost me the game uh, it would have been interesting to see how that game might have been different if i had chosen to use the um inferno just to clear the field instead So obviously the game plan for these next two games is to just prevent us from even getting to that point. Cut off Gnarly from ever being able to make those kind of established plays uh, and just keep it contained and then grind it out from there. Because the Gnarly the Thotep deck, if it can't like grind, it, like pop off, it doesn't have super great grind outside of like Dogra Magra because a lot of its stuff is really aggressive and requires those pumps from things like Red Wine and Bread to be more than just like Swifty 4-4s. Four Calls a second stone there and says pass turn. Calls second stone for a stemma and say pass. The order killer deck is perfectly fine just waiting, uh, biding its time for the other deck to make a move. See a red wine and bread come down here and then this is again punish the enter effect right so before the resolves gets the enter effect to then trigger resonance we're going to use a tendon of asmodeus force him to banish in addition which then triggers his stemma and lets us draw a card so we turned on a tendon of asmodeus into a cantrip to keep that red wine and bread off board and also means he just doesn't have a pump for the turn sudden manifestation of power comes down here Now, he hasn't called stone yet this turn. But canceling this does mean that if he, he wouldn't be able to order this turn. Ultimately, we say, no, this is okay. We're going to let you do sudden manifestation of power. Um, we're going to save the tools we have in our hand for a little bit later. And down comes an ordered red riding hood. Now, she's going to trigger, get her two stones into play tapped. But this is an aggression piece, right? She'll gain swiftness. Currently, she's sitting at being a 4-7. But as we saw in the previous games, there's all about trying to have punishes for the answers for the enters so we're going to see a witch of the fallen or fallen angel of black tears to give minus four minus four draw a card and then a second one to give it minus eight minus eight total which will let us survive the reason why we're going for this play is because these at least can trip just naturally because we've already used the astema trigger and there's not a lot in this matchup that the Fallen Angel of uh, Black Tears will be able to kill just by itself. So we might as well cycle through two cards, get this thing off board, um, keep our hand as stacked as possible, um, and, and go from there. We do see a uh, Rebirth of Flaming Disaster using that last card uh, stone for the turn, uh, although he will be able to call stone potentially, um, to try to kill this on his own terms. Now we could use a Gary in here. I believe we have one in hand. Ultimately though, because we have that Virgil, I think we're going for a different play line. And because we know that if he does try to play uh, a red wine and bread with the call stone, we could use Gary in for that, steal the advantage off of that and only risks taking uh, a grand total of 16 damage, which we can reestablish pretty effectively. See a stone call. And then no red wine and bread comes down here. Swings in for all four pieces. Takes us down to 24, which we say that's totally fine. And then draw for a turn. Thing if we want to do anything before recovery to not make it to be able to use that gear um that carlina will ultimately saying no we're, we're just gonna move it on now we've got a couple options here um we're gonna go ahead and risk calling stone if we do get luck we do get 
uh, paid off for it by being able to play Six Age Stone. Now, do you want to mention something here? There was no reason to not use the Six Age Stone here. Um, the Bradstone is now currently at being unlocked, so it actually is safer for us to go ahead and use the Bradstone first, just in case. Um, ultimately, that's just something to kind of note in this deck. Um, so we're going to kill two things, produce red, black, using a Stemma, uh, and then get to kill a Stemma to play our one card for turn, which will be Virgil. And the reason why we want the Floating Wheel here is because um, we want to be able to keep our stone base up for what we're being able to protect ourselves during our opponent's turn. So once the Virgil comes into play, we're going to go ahead and do the God Artifact of Carlina. Offering Paul the option there in response. He says, no, that's fine. And then we're going to go ahead and swing for 10 and then use the one floating from Astema to then get to ping everything for four damage, which is great. It kills both the tokens because it's got Drain Bane, shoots Paul, so we get to gain 1,200 life back, and then I get to swing in for 10, go back up to 46, and because the front side of a stem is different, now we produce another Black Will when his token dies, and we can use that on Virgil too. So we kind of waste the wed Red Will, but that's okay. We leave up three Will for during his turn, and we take us down to a nice, clean, like total swap of 22 to 50. This also puts us in a really good spot because we still have the Asema God's Art and we have this repeatable Bane Drain trigger for a turn that we need it. So not only do we have cards in hand to be able to deal with things like an Isis, but we have a card on board. Sudden Manifestation of Power comes into play. We see that's fine. If you feel like you need to cantrip for the temporary stone, we feel pretty good about what we're doing here. Then we see that stone immediately get banished to produce um, for Relay. And I think what we're going to do is just produce black, have a floating black here, ready to use for Virgil should something come down that we're concerned about. Got a floating red before he banished it. And then we are going to use that floating red and one stone to grab an Isis. And this is what I said, there's this enter effect on the chase. This is your prime moment to punish Gnarly. So what we're doing is in response to the enter, we're going to try to resolve the God Art effect of Astema. He says that's fine. We get to go get an Inferno, but now that means that we can use that floating black. We have Drain and Bane with Virgil, so we can shoot the Isis before its enter effect resolves. Even though it's a 9-9 and can survive something like a Gradius, we have um, Bane and Drain. So we get to shoot it and kill it. One of the things about Carlina just in general is if any kind of ways you can find to get around being only play one spell a turn and still have a lot of flexibility is really good. Um, it keeps you um, able to keep up um, and do all kinds of just high value things afterwards. Choosing to just ignore the stone that's gonna come into play tapped calling stone there doesn't must not have anything to worry about banishing stones wondering what the follow-up is knowing though that he still has to deal with a bane drain virgil for the turn and he's already performed order but also knowing that if he leaves that Virgil on the field, uh, especially since I have Aerothropia, I'm just going to be able to recharge it uh, and also probably get him down to zero very quickly. So we're going to see a banish of two magic stones to play a Dogra Magra. Just going to high roll it and hopefully kill the Virgil. No real response there. We say that's fine if you want to waste the resources to do that. There's a chance that I don't get killed. Ultimately, though, rolling, I believe, a 16. Uh, so gets to shoot for 16 damage, gain 16, go back up to 38. And down comes a dog. At that point in time, being completely tapped out. Um... And what we'll do is, in response to the attack, float some will, and then, because we still haven't cast a card this turn, and we've resolved the God's Art of Astema, we still have the ability to do Quick Cast Inferno, forcing him to banish all of his entities, because, once again, we've kept our board completely clear. 
Calling stone with a stemma since she's already dead. This hits us a six stage stone, which we're going to use to float some will. And then once again, I don't know why I'm not just using leaving the Bradstone open. Down comes a Garion, which is very, very good against order decks. So there's a lot of these decks that rely on one drops. As you can see currently in his hand, he has three one drops. Now he goes to cast um, the dog here to force me to banish an entity and I go to banish it but what we're going to recognize is that uh, he doesn't have black will anymore because I forced him to do the relay banish so he, he plays this I go mm, I don't know if I have a way to stop that because it's ordered and then we move to there but then I go wait a minute you don't have access to black will to be able to cast that at which point Paul goes oh wait no there then I have no way to win from there because my hand is nothing but one drops so Gary and coming down there after the interactions does prove to close out the game from locking out the Nyarlathotep deck from being able to recover. And we move on to game three. So now you've seen a little bit about what the Order Killer deck is trying to do in terms of like when it's successful of just preventing the Gnarly deck, preventing the Order deck from being able to establish. You're just playing this nice grind to make them make the first move. Um, it's one of the reasons why, as I've talked, um, I believe on the podcast before, that I think Gnarly Lithotep to be competitively viable has to play a little bit differently. Um, I've seen people experimenting a lot with turning it into a more mid-range burn deck. Um, that just can sometimes threaten the pop off and therefore your resources and kind of what your threats are kind of change. Um, and I wonder if that is where she can find the most competitive success because as much as what Nyarlathotep is doing here or what Order Killer is doing here in terms of being able to do it very efficiently um, because of the will from Carlina and stuff, there are other options to be able to punish it. It's also why Kaguya is very good because you can cancel enter effects with things like Feathsing and cancel spells with things like Hanzo. Um, and you do have spot removal. Down comes that first turn, Red Riding Hood ordered. And down comes the Gradius to kill it. He doesn't have any stones available because he's used Energize to be able to play the Gnarly on one, or the Red Riding Hood on one. So Gradius becomes a cantrip gets a stone and then just chooses to call stone pass. So this, the one stone that would come into, or two stones that would come into play tapped are just gonna get put to the bottom. He doesn't have a way to banish to get the cost out of them this turn. So just doing a little bit of shortcutting there. Once again, calling stone with Stemma. Passing the turn there, end of turn, we see Phantasmal Ascendant, Attendant which in response to his enter effect, we do have a Fallen Angel of uh, Black Tears, which that is one of the one things that we can kill if it's just a Resonator, which thankfully actually draws us two. It draws us once off its ability and then cantrips with a Stemma to draw us another one. So keeping our hand advantage high, giving ourselves the most potential options to be able to keep Isis in control. Speaking of an ordered Isis, in response to her enter effects, we're gonna go ahead and do, like I said before, Dance of Spirits to silence her. So she'll get to produce this floating will, but it's not gonna be able to do anything this turn. This is the, the key moment here. We want to make Isis feel as bad as possible until we can answer her with a removal. So it gets to call stone, um, can still banish to draw cards, which is fine, but that does give us a card as well because it's banishing an entity. does manage those two temporary stones and then just has to pass. Now the Isis is nice because it is protected from a Gradius. It is a 9-9. Nine nine. Uh, it can't lose the pump from the order. So even uh, even if we Gradius it, it does still has the pump, um, which is very, very good for him. Now there's a world where we risk tapping Carlina to be able to produce red black to play the Estema. There's also a thought of based on what's in hand, we could stall by calling stone for Estema, or we can take a big risk and see if there's a way to hit a six eight or get a most value out of it. Um, like the least safe play, I suppose, uh, and call stone with Estema, 
trying to hit a six H stone to then be able to recover her. Because if we can, then we're at a really good spot because we can pay two, we can then immediately judgment the Estema, we can kill the Isis with Estema's effect and be back to this kind of, we're constantly drawing cards and stake above you card value wise and will value wise that we are looking for. Ultimately, we do choose to go that route. We do hit the six Sage Stone, which is great. Once again, tapping Bradstone, which I don't need to do. Um, this is le learning from my mistakes. You should always leave up Magic Stone of Knowledge and use your six Sage Stones first because Magic Stone of Knowledge is producing five color. So we kill the Isis, we get to draw two cards. And then I think we have to move to discard here due to hand size, which is a good problem to be having. Um, certainly some cards that now that we are at this point don't feel as necessary. Uh, things like a second copy of number 13, um, certainly not going to do much. I believe we have multiple copies of the silence in hand as well. Also not super relevant. Moving to discard, we see a number two number 13s and a Mermaid of the Despairing Voice getting discarded. Mermaid also showing us that in this particular situation is not the best card um, because we're kind of ahead uh, and we have um, ice, uh, a semi on field to be able to block something. Um, and the cancel is just not really doing much, especially since the Nyarlathotep deck relies so much on ordering um, that the, the number 13 is just not going to do much. Once again, we see an ordered Red Riding Hood and same second verse, same as the first. We have another Gradius, which feels kind of bad because it is a way it turns off our own ways or limits our own ways to be able to turn off our own Ostema. Like we have to be able to win the game still, um, but it is great because it's going to get to draw some more cards um, and makes again his order for the turn feel not so great. He gets those two temporary stones. He is keeping them this time, which makes me think that he has a way to be able to banish them. Ultimately, though, saying, nope, just pass the turn. I'm going to keep those in, in the stone deck for later. Now that we have uh, a Stemma out, um, we're just going to use her to call stone. We're going to leave Carlina open. We've got the draw power from a Stemma valued here. Um, once again, I <laughs> actively choosing to use the two knowledge stones first to be able to play a card for turn, which would be a Faresia. This is a really good card for Carlina, just like in the same sense that Virgil helps to give us options without having to cast cards. We don't run as many green cards in this deck. Um, I think there's a grand total of 13 total. Um, so we don't have as many like as many ways to pay green and pop um but having the option especially with being able to give stuff barrier as well you know making cards feel a lot less important um feels pretty good choosing to move to discard there hit and discarding a uh, demon of explosions rather than paying the one will and just using it you see a red wine and bread come down and as we've seen before in response to the enter effect just to kind of mitigate any kind of chances of that giving a field pump, we're going to use Attendant of Asmodeus um, to make, force him to vanish. This will then proc a Stemma, and we will get to draw two cards. So yeah, we had to discard the hand size, but we're about to draw back up to be over hand size. Second red wine and bread comes down. That one we are going to go ahead and say no to with a Garion. Down comes an ordered little red. This is the moment where you gotta be really careful because what we're doing, I believe, uh, comes down to we want to be able to like what will are we floating we float green and something else to try to use uh Faresia to kill little red which is successful um so he'll get two stones into play tapped but he's used his order this turn he can still call stone um but we're sitting on some kind of will ultimately though chooses just to pass the turn so those two stones just get cycled back to the bottom so still not having way many ways to banish See the hand right there is looks like sudden manifestation of power uh gradius and another demon dog we're gonna go ahead and take the advantage we say you know what six will is probably enough right now we don't really need to worry about getting too much more let's start whittling you down to lethal so swing it for a total of 18 damage between Faresia and estema and then just use the pass the turn So 
Unfortunately, like sudden manifestation of power is good for a cantrip right now. Gradius is okay, but it can't kill a stamina. Uh, and we have the barrier option. So just a single Gradius by itself doesn't do much. Uh, and he can't cast the dog because he doesn't have access to the uh, addition right now. So Paul's deck, like we said, if it can't get established, feels a little clumsy. Um, and that's just the nature of Nyar Lothotep. If, she, if you can keep her contained, she, she doesn't, as we've seen her be built, if you keep her contained, um, she she struggles to to output much threat. It's just when she gets going that you have to be terrified. <laughs> um, so a red wine and bread comes down. This is going to look very familiar. We're going to see uh, an attendant of Asmodeus to force him to banish, which is going to draw us even more cards here. Does get a stone. Manifestation of power comes down. You see, that's fine. We're really wanting to set ourselves up to... Oh, we are going to do something in response. I think we start to cast a silence, but we don't want to yet, because if there is a card in his hand, if there's an Isis in hand right now, he can respond to our silence, and um, he can respond to the silence and order an Isis, uh, at which point in time he can kind of pop off anyway because there's enough quick cast stuff. So we'd rather wait and see because it's just a manifestation right now. It's also not getting him any kind of resonance triggers. Another sudden manifestation comes into play. See, now we have that ordered Isis. So whether he had that at hand or not when we did the silence, um, we still feel good about that decision. In response to the enter effect, we're going to go ahead and use Phoresia to shoot it for a thousand damage. Which at that point in time, we're gonna sack some temporary stones and try to refill the hand a little bit. Float some red will with Isis and banish that stone as well. She has three Gradius in hand. Floating some more red. Just trying to see what we can instant speed draw to make use of this Isis as best we can before it gets killed. Ultimately, just seeing a lot of endgame pieces, unfortunately. Looks like a couple manifestations of power. Ooh, and choosing to banish stones that are going to stay, uh, that we're going to stay. Really trying to dig here. Three copies of Gradius. Looks like the card that banishes stones and Drox cards. I don't remember exactly what that card is called. But ultimately, Isis gonna get killed. He does have two floating red will. Can still call to stone this turn, but the hand is, and he does have a relay, um, which does get him a little closer. Banish one of the stones that was tapped. We do see that arena expansion relay come in. So it does have access to black will now, which is great. The dog's not super great here. Uh, I mean, he can bane with it to try to kill the Estema potentially, but that kind of gets me closer to um, my win con uh, because then I only have to worry about killing Carlina. Um, so uh, it's a little tricky. Still has two floating red to make use of. Trying to figure out 
if any stones are going to get shuffled back in. Ultimately, they are going to, I think, stay, because this puts him at a total of 10 stones between field and grave, which is exactly how many he needs for Dogra. So it actually makes sense for him to just let them be in grave. He's still got 10 stones left in his stone deck, and you see he just drew a Dogra Magra off of the relay. So definitely still has some something here um, to be able to make use of. Probably not going to cast Dog Dogra Magra right now, because he'd have to banish his two remaining stones. Um... But we are going to see some floating red. He's going to float black, I believe, actually. Down comes with one red, the floating manifestation of power. And this is when we decide to act. We say, look, you only have floating will here. Um, you've already been banishing stones. You've got a million cards in your hands. Uh, you don't have access to Isis because it's one red, one black. We're going to cast our one spell for the turn, and we are going to cast the Silence. So we're going to use Dance of Spirits here to silence him. We want that red, black to not feel nearly as good. We want that Sunless and Manifestation of Power to not get generate as much value. Um, and so this feels this feels pretty good for us as a like further cementing the kind of position. We're going to let him get a stone. It's going to go away at the end of the turn, um, but even and then um it's gonna go away at the end of the turn and it, so he's not gonna have a way to use that stone very effectively because he also doesn't have a way to banish it to produce to for cost for anything because he can't cast any spells so it makes sudden manifestation feel really bad and at the end of the turn he has to discard the hand size and away goes the demon dog it's going to draw for turn leaving paul with two stones to r6 between carlina and the four stones which makes us feel really good. Swing in for 12, swing in for six, takes him down to 400. Gonna see a Demon of Explosions to take him down to negative 100, but can't do anything about that. I mean, even though he's at negative 100 life, um, he can't lose. So we'd have to have a way to be able to um, kill Nyarlathotep here. And the problem is, or kill Ice, kill Stemma and kill um, Carlina, as well as go into Stan and get him, keep him below. And the reason why we're not trying to do any, trying to do that right now is because we're worried about um, Dogra Magra. Dogra Magra is the big concern here because if in response to me trying to turn off a Stemma, he just Dogra Magras, uh, he can go back up above to that, uh, zero life. So we want to try to say, is there a way we can get you at negative below 2000 uh, so that a Dogra Magra can't actually bring you back? So we see a Call Stone, so we're not going to have to worry about orders this turn. Sudden Manifestation of Bower to continue to try to dig. This does put him at a potential being able to double Dogra Magra us, which is a little bit terrifying. I'm gonna go ahead and say, you know what? No, we're gonna we're gonna stop. We're gonna go for the silence. <laughs> right now, we're gonna try to silence you um, to say once again we want this sudden manifestation to feel as little value as possible, um, and we don't want to get dog red. Shipping away that stone means that because Dr. Magra costs two to play, um, because he can't cast, a, I mean, he could have cast the Dr. Magra in response, um, but he didn't have, he, he would still only be at one stone then going into our turn, uh, so he wouldn't be able to do double. So he's at negative one. We're going to swing at him for 18, take him down to negative 19. If we had discarded that red demon to a in Instead of discarding it to hand size, it'd burn him for five. He'd be at negative 24, and we'd be safe from a Dogra Magra. But ultimately, we take him down to negative 19, which means that if he's got a Dogra in hand, he can go back up to 20, um, which takes him back to 100 life. And this is why tracking negatives is important when you're dealing with this Nemo.
Gonna attempt to Gradius my own Estema during my turn. Reason we're doing it during my turn is we want to see if he's gonna try to do Dogra during our turn and banish those stones before he can make use of them. To which he says, yeah, I'm going to. I'm gonna Dogra Magra. Uh, chooses to target my face for two grand of damage after floating some red will, banishing those two stones. And I do miss uh, the Estema trigger here to draw two cards um, because he does have to banish those stones. I do miss that, um, which would make that dogger feel even worse, really. I mean, it keeps him alive. He kind of has to, um, but I do get to draw two cards. Um, and it does set me up to a position where if I draw another demon of explosion, you know, maybe I drew into a demon of explosions and then take him back down below or something like that. Um, I can't cancel it uh, because it costs three and I don't have any other spells for the turn. But going into his turn, um, if he wants to try to order, he either has to order a one drop, which we've been able to kill pretty consistently, or he has to call stone and not be able to order. Down comes that Gradius. Gradius in response, we're going to go ahead and try to give it barrier. He says, I'll burn another Gradius to get rid of it. Um, so now Faresia is off the board, so I can't protect the Estema nearly as much anymore. And I don't have as many ways to be able to kill J rulers. We are going to see that ordered... Um, Red Riding Hood come into play here. And this puts us in a really weird spot because we have a Gradius in our hand, uh, but we have no other way to turn off our Estema currently. Um, so we have to kill the Red Riding Hood. We have to keep him at a position where it has to be Dogger Magra for lethal. Uh, we get to do, draw two cards when it dies. So we're now digging for something to kill him. Uh, and turn off our Stemma before he gets to a Dogger Magra. He can still call Stone. Especially now that we've used our one spell for the turn, so we have no way to cancel a Dogra if he casts it. There's another Gradius in hand. Looks like the Demon Dog. Ultimately choosing just to pass the turn there. We're going to... We started to do something before turn on recovery, and I think we change our minds. Still not seeing anything that takes us to um, the limit. The other thought of reason why not to do it is we want to be able to protect our stem a little bit better. Swinging in in the air to take him down to negative 11. And then ultimately, because we have nothing to be able to kill a Stebo, we have to just pass the turn. Before we move to recover, we move to just straight move to recovery. Paul staring down. Knowing what the out is and staring down, just having to dig for it, we see a Phantasmal Ascendant ordered. We're going to go ahead and do as we've done before with double Fallen Angel of Black Tears to kill it um, before its enter effect can resolve. The problem is he's at negative 11, so he can't banish stones to kill the Estema here, at least while he's got a guy, because it'll turn off my abilities, which then he immediately loses. Um, so I get to draw. I draw two more off of it dying. So drew four cards there, still not seeing something to be able to help us. Um, I see a stone call, and we see some going to go for... This, the black card, which whose name I forget, um, it's the Sparkling of the Magic Stones, Sparkling Blessing of the Magic Stones, where he can um, pay three, banish any number of Magic Stones, draw that many number of cards, and get that many number of Magic Stones into play tapped. He's got the stones for it, he's trying to dig four deep to, to see if he can find one of those Dogra Magras. Now, I have a, like, it's the idea of, if I had a cancel in hand, maybe um, we can try to do something about it. 
Um, but not really. You see, I do have that attendant of Asmodeus in hand. I can force him to at least banish. We're gonna try to draw. We're, we still have a turn for the turn card for the turn. We're gonna fallen angel our own Estema to see if we can draw into something to turn her off. Um, before uh, I do play Charlotte's Light Transformation Magic, so trying to draw into that before this Stone Call thing resolves, because I'm really just I need him to not hit another Dogra. <laughs> so he draws four, um, gets four stones into play tapped. And then ultimately just has to pass the turn. Did not see it off the draw. After, uh, I think we're going into bef after draw before recovery. Oh no, we're just going into recovery. I think we have a Virgil in hand. Um... I'm going to use Ascendant of Asmodeus here to force him to banish the addition. Which will then trigger a Stemma, drop, uh, produces red black. And then we, we start, we, we sequence this a little bit. We start to go to cast the Virgil. And then before we do that, though, we're going to go ahead and float uh, green black to perform the Judgment Effect of Carlina. In response to that, we're going to float double black off of the Carlina. So now we've got three black and one red floating. We can kill the Estema to play the Virgil. We've got three black floating and the ability to God's art the Estema because we haven't done that yet. So now we have Drain and Bane with Virgil. We can use one of the floating black to ping our own Carlina with Drain and Vein, she only takes damage from things of two drop or less, so she'll still take the four damage, which will then kill her. I will go up to 2400 life. Now I'm safe, I'm outside of a dog or magra range, which is nice. Reveal the stand. From the sideboard. Swing in for uh, a thousand there. It takes him down to 21. Now outside of even healing himself out of Dogger Mega range, go up to 34. And then we can use the two remaining floating black to replace the Stemma with Stan, which will then put him, remove the ability that I can't win the game, and that will be. It. So that is the concession from Paul there. Does look like the last two cards of the deck were Dogger Magro, so it looks like he mulliganed them away and just couldn't draw deep enough. That is one of the things about the Nearly deck. It doesn't search. It just draws a million cards. So a little bit unfortunate there, uh, but a really great back and forth between these two decks. Really appreciated, Paul. If you want to see me get absolutely clapped by Nyarlathotep from this matchup, join the channel as a member. We have that video up right now. It's kind of a behind-the-scenes thing. Deck profiles for both of these lists will be up later this week. And until next time, this is DMO73 saying, class dismissed.